Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our 217faith.church weekly service. We greet you in the name of the Lord, and we hope that you will hear God's word today and be moved into faithful action. Today, we want to share with you the benefits of establishing a proper connection with God. We'd like to direct you to our ministry website, 217faith.church, where you may find previous services and other teachings to aid you in your Christian walk. Also, while you're there, you'll find opportunities to put your faith into action. During this month of August, we will be partnering with World Vision International Child Sponsorship to help children around the world to find a path to good health, out of poverty, and most importantly, a path back to God. Please, Navigate over to our website and donate directly to this worthy organization. Let us reach out to the farthest corners of this world with a word of hope from God and truly have an impact in the lives of these children. Please give all that you can as often as you can. We are excited this month to introduce a new resource from 217faith.church to aid you in your own Christian journey. Uh, this book is a detailed study into the lives of many biblical characters and how God used them and how through God's grace, he saw them not only through their spiritual wilderness experience, but also how God saw them out of it and how it was a blessing to their lives and to others. Uh, throughout the book, you'll find my own testimony being intertwined in it, and I simply pray that God will use uh, uh, their experience, and as well as mine, to encourage you and others to stay the course and remain faithful to God, even in the midst of your own dark nights of the soul, knowing that not only will God see you through it, but that he will use your situation to draw others near to him. Uh, you may secure your copy, uh, either on Amazon or Google Books, uh, as well directly from the Bold Press Publishing. Uh, we have a link available on the front page of our ministry website, at 217faith.church. We pray that this resource uh, will be a blessing uh, to you as it's been uh, for us to prepare it. Amen. Our scripture for today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 37, and just a few verses to get us going today. We'll start right in verse 3, where we read, Trust the Lord and do good. Live in the land and farm faithfully. Enjoy the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your ways to the Lord, trust him, and he will act and will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the high noon. Be still before the Lord and wait for him. Don't get upset when someone else gets ahead or someone who invents evil schemes. Amen. May the word of God grant us hope and understanding this day that we may choose to follow him and remain 
connected to his faithfulness every day. You know, technology these days helps us to stay connected, right, with one another, whether it is across the street, across the country, across the world. That is when it works properly, right? Nothing worse in our modern age than to be stuck with a slow internet connection speed, right? Even perhaps as you're trying to watch this video, I hope that it is not buffeting on you too much. I am certainly old enough to remember when we jumped from the old 14.4 kbps to the mighty 28.8 kilobits of information per second. Sounds fast, doesn't it? Well, if you had the whole day to download a single song, then yes, that was pretty fast. Yet by comparison, under the 5G connection speeds that we enjoy today, we can expect to download information at 100 megabytes of information per second. You're like, what does all that mean, boy? Well, that's an increase of over 100,000 times. One megabyte equals 1,000 kilobytes. Incredible, truly. And just wait and see what sorts of speeds we may be surfing the net and just being connected with one another in, in, in 20 years to come, right? And yet, if technology is not utilized as it is intended, then all the speed in the world is not truly going to matter, right? I've heard a story once of when electricity was a new thing. Yes, I'm not that old, but I heard a story about it. And there was a local company that decided to, to test uh, th this new electricity and they installed cables uh, and it was being carried into six homes in this particular street. After about three months of running their experiment, they noticed that while five of the houses had performed as expected, the last house on the block had barely used any of its electrical power at all. Several company personnel decided to pay a visit to the home where they realized that it was a little old lady that had lived there for most of her life. When they arrived, the homeowner invited them in, and in the process of the conversation, they asked if anything was wrong with her electricity, as they had noticed that she had barely used any of it at all in the last three months. To this, she responded to them, oh, no, everything is fine. Every night, I turn on the light switch on just long enough for me to go find my candles and matches. And once I light them, then I just turn the electricity off. Now, here's a simple illustration of a person that was connected to an unlimited power, a power source who she chose to instead not to utilize as they had been intended and to rather settle for that which was familiar to her, for what she was comfortable with. So, as we dive into God's Word today, I want you to think of these questions. What are things that are familiar in your life, which you still cling to? What are things so comfortable in your past experiences that you still fall back on those behaviors? What connections do you retain from your past that do not necessarily add any value to your life today? Or perhaps, what new connections are you making in your current situations that do add value to your life? The road to recovery back to God is not an easy one, but it is not a road that we walk alone. It is not unique to us. Any person that deals with any sort of sin in their lives is on the same path. The Word of God itself tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Did you hear that? All. Yes, you, but also me and everyone else. Now, what sort of new connection then can we make in our lives today that can offer us a way out of our sin, restoration, if you will, back to a better way of living? to the unlimited source of, of hope and grace. Well, as we mentioned earlier, today we want to share with you what a connection with God can offer. And Psalm 37 is a great passage of scripture that King David wrote. You've heard of him, right? He was that same kid that fought Goliath the giant. Yeah, he's the same man that fell short from time to time on the expectations of God. I encourage you to open your Bibles and read the rest of, of Psalm 37. But yet, just we're going to focus on a few verses together here. And we'll jump to verse 25, where we're given a glimpse that was written by David. And believe it or not, David wrote this Psalm when he was a little older. And he's perhaps seeking to motivate uh, his, son, his own son 
And he seeks to uh, let him know what a proper connection, intentional connection can do in his own life. Now, if you will remember, David had been a shepherd, a giant killer, a musician, a faithful servant of the king. He had been a general, a runaway, a liar, a deceiver, a sinner, an adulterer, a murderer. Yet God himself in the scripture testifies that David was a man after God's own heart. How can this be? You see, the things that David had done in the past did not define him, just as the sins that we have committed should not define us either. Those are mistakes that if they're corrected by the grace of God, then they are cast away, says the Bible, as far as the east is from the west. You see, the problem that when we put ourselves into boxes, we merely identify ourselves by our mistakes, our preferences, our denominations, our age groups, skin colors, or even food choices, we create divisions. We attempt to hold ourselves up somehow better than other people. And whoever does not fit into our little group, into our little box, and they are excluded, they are left out. God does not look at the outward appearance or even at our past disobedience, but he looks at our hearts. And that is who we truly are. Hear this. In his heart, David was humble and respectful of God, trusting and loving and devoted and faithful, obedient. And best of all, David was repentant. He messed up, but he always came back to the source of power, to his intentional connection with God. This experience in my own life has helped me to keep my eyes on my Savior, even when I do fall short of his glory, even when my sin seems to overwhelm me. As David is looking back into his life in Psalm 37, he recalls the important things. And he remembers what a good connection with God offers to the weary soul. Therefore. The first thing that I want us to remember today is simply this. A good connection with God gives us faith in the middle of fear. Repeat this with me. Faith in the middle of fear. Do you remember the name uh, Bernie Murdoch? He was a man who ran a, a Wall Street investment firm. Uh, it was a few years back. And it was discovered that he had lied and wrongly invested a bunch of money and lost over $50 billion for all of his investors. Now, this represented people's savings, retirement accounts, their livelihoods. And over time, it was all gone. During his trial Many of his victims came and gave testimony about why the judge should not be lenient with him, but should punish Bernie severely. In the end, Murdoch received something like 150 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, if there's one thing that most humans fear is the lack of money. And it is understandable, right? It is necessary to secure a living condition, to food to eat, uh, pay for the gas and the bills at home, right? Yet this fear paralyzes us because it makes us take our eyes off of Jehovah Jireh, our provider, our true provider, and it focuses us instead on what we can do to provide for ourselves. For over 30 years, Bernie got away with it. And even in prison, he was not sent to a tough, scary prison like the ones we see in the movie, perhaps like the ones that, that some of you listening may have experienced in your own life. No, he was sent to a medical facility with medium to low security because of his advanced age. He's, I believe, now in his, in his late 70s. Many people lost their means of financial support. And I'm sure the fear for the future took a hold of them, at least as they wonder, what are they going to do now? David had experienced other people getting away with it, if you will. And in our passage for today, on three separate verses, David says to us, don't get upset over evildoers. Verse 7, he says, don't get upset when someone who invents evil schemes gets ahead. Verse 8, he says, don't get upset because it will only lead to rage. In other words, he is telling the reader to trade the possibility of being afraid for the greater advantage of hoping in God and remaining connected to him. Rage is an uncontrollable anger. Anger that often leads to fear. Now, I'm sure that we have all experienced this sort of emotions in our life before. Frustration, 
even discouragement. As you can imagine, this, this, these feelings blind us to our actions and they lead us to more anger, to more frustration. It is a selfish, self-fulfilling emotion that provides more of itself. And in the end, we become bitter. We become indifferent. We become spiritually frustrated with God. And often we break that connection with him. Friends, this is not what God desires from us. If this is where you are spiritually, then I pray that you will seek God's guidance today. David had experienced the wrath of King Saul, who had physically thrown spears at him and chased him around the country, intent on killing him. David experienced the lies being told about him, his child scheming to take the kingdom away from him. At one point in his life, David even experienced great rage after an enemy kidnapped his family, and he went after them and destroyed them to take his family back. You see, we get upset when others get ahead, when they mistreat us, especially when we know that they are bad people or that they are doing wrong, because we are afraid that if a bad person can get away doing bad things, then what hope is there for us who are trying to live a faithful life following God. Yet, when we are connected to the endless source of God's love, He is the one who strengthens our faith, our trust in Him, and then we can hold on to His promises so that hope rather than fear flows in and out of our hearts when we face difficult situations. There are two physiological reactions to fear. They are pre-installed, if you will, into the brain of a human being. When we feel afraid or threatened, we either run or we stand our ground. Uh, flight or fright, I think, I think is what I've heard that call before. Fear can be a healthy thing. It can be a, a safety mechanism. Let's say uh, you meet a wild animal in the woods and you have no means of defending yourself. Well, running away might be the best course, right? If you're being harassed at work and put down and bullied, you may want to run away. But perhaps this is an occasion when you need to stand your ground and find a way through it. God brings, brings us the assurance that he is with us, with those who put their trust in him, and that he will never leave us or forsake us as long as we remain faithful to his will in our lives. Now, additionally, God promises to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We find that in the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Back in Psalm 37, David testifies to God's goodness that those who do wrong will soon fade away like grass. Those evildoers will be eliminated. And those who seek the hope of the Lord, those who put their faith in him, will possess God's promises. Therefore, my friends, hold on to your faith in God, trust in him, and do good for his honor and glory as far as you are concerned. Now, the second thing I like for us to remember today is that a connection with God provides us guidance in our decisions. Repeat that with me. Guidance in our decisions. In verse 5 that we read today, it says, commit your ways to the Lord, trust him, and he will help you. You see, to commit, it means to surrender to something fully. Many of us are committed to a certain way of life, a life of obedience towards God. And as we surrender fully to it, it will produce good fruit and a positive growth in our lives. If this is not you yet, then, well, we're here for you. And whenever you decide to follow the one true God, please reach out to us. We do want to hear from you. We want to walk this journey with you. When we commit, we surrender. Repeat that with me. When we commit, we surrender. When we surrender, it means that no longer is what I want, but what somebody else does. In this case, we join Jesus in his prayer when he surrendered to God. And we say, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Now, until we learn to trust in God, we will not be able to commit. Yet once again, once we do, it will open the doors of God's blessings for our lives. They will be poured out and bless others as well. God will guide us in our prayers, just as we learned a couple of weeks ago. And yet our prayers can sometimes be a little selfish. Don't you agree? Me, 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 I need, I want. 
do this for me. And while that's fine to a point, as we pray, we should learn to acknowledge that God is a good God who is looking out for us, a loving Father who has our best at heart. And as we learn to accept this truth, then in verse 4 of Psalm 37, David says that we will be able to delight in the Lord. You see, when you think of surrender, you may think of it as a negative thing, right? Perhaps in a battle, one side surrenders to the other. But it is truly meant to replace my will with God's will. And because God's will is good, then I can delight or I can enjoy it. And here's the blessing. David says that when we delight in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our hearts. I have a friend who would say, so does that mean that God will give me a purpose, a house, a car, a beautiful wife, well-behaved children, a, a super cool boss? Well, if that's your heart's true desire, and if that lines up with God's will for your life, then, then I would say yes. How do I know that? Because that's exactly what God has blessed me in my life. I haven't always been in this place in my life, but this is where God has me now, through faithfulness and obedience. But here's the kicker. When we talk about the desires of our hearts, we're not merely talking about a list of selfish things, right, that we may dream of. No. We're talking about that when we are connected with God, when we surrender to him, then his will becomes our will. His desires become our desires. And then th what does God desire from us? The prophet Micah spells it out in Micah 6 a. He says that we act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. If we do these things and we find ourselves in need of a home or a car or a family, then yes, I believe God will provide those things for you. As I've testified, he has been doing so in my own life. Now, I'm not talking about the lies of prosperity, but simply the meeting of our needs, which God promises to do so. The dictionary defines delight as something that we take great pleasure in, something that brings us great joy. As we learn to commit to God, as we delight in his goodness in our lives, then we will experience his guidance. His power will flow through us because we will be connected to him. We will develop a more profound prayer practice and we will understand that he is sovereign and in control and not those that may frustrate us or cause us greater pain. As a result of this complete surrender, of this act of faith on our side towards a faithful and good God, we will experience the third thing that I like to mention today. And that is that a connection with God offers us peace in our hearts. Repeat that with me, please. Peace in our hearts. There was an old king who offered a prize to the artists of his town uh, to come up with the best painting or the best representation of what peace is. Out of all the efforts submitted, the king focused on the final two. One was a, a beautiful picture of a calm lake, like the ones you see up in the mountains in the movies, right? A perfect mirror reflecting the blue skies and the clouds. And all agreed this was the perfect representation of peace. Yet the king turned to the other painting of a great waterfall, which flowed over some rugged cliffs. Overhead was a gray sky, and it looked like a storm was brewing. The water was foaming over as it struck into the ground below with great force, and, and one could imagine that it was just a trembling sound. But as the king looked closer, he saw that there was a small tree that was growing out of a crack on a rock, just to the side of the waterfall, beneath all of this violence and sound. In the tree, there was a mother bird that had built her nest. And there, amidst all of the natural violence and impending storm, sat a bird perfectly at peace. So the king ended up choosing the second picture as a representation of peace, as he explains that he had chosen that one. Because peace does not mean we are in a place where there is no more trouble or no more hard work. Instead, peace means that while we are in the midst of all the crazy stuff that life throws our way, we can still be calm in our hearts. What a beautiful imagery, isn't it? 
God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Serenity is peace, peace of mind, peace in our hearts. Yet, Lord, grant me the courage to change the things that I can, which is myself, regardless of what I may be going through. This is exactly what God offers you and me. These last couple of years in my life have been quite the crazy storm. They seemed to go on and never stop. And I had days where I felt great sadness or abandonment or being alone. But I've come to understand that God did not necessarily promise to remove me from those situations. But what he does promise me is his peace in the middle of it all. And I can remember that very night when I finally felt the peace of God in my heart. And all that he requires of me is to be still, to have faith instead of fear. To trust his guidance and delight in his will for my life. David said it in Psalm 37, 7. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. If we don't, if we get ahead of ourselves, then well, that's when we usually get in trouble, right? Much like the little old lady in our opening illustration, we must be careful always to stay connected to the complete source of God's power. His grace. His mercy. Even when it feels like it's at a low speed, let's say, stay connected to God through your prayers, through the reading of His Word, and most importantly, through the fellowship with other believers. So then, what are the benefits of having a proper connection with God? Repeat with me. Faith in the middle of fear. Guidance in our decisions. And peace in our hearts. What do you need to do today to surrender to God? Perhaps our will, our expectations, how we think, think things should turn out. What do we need to commit over to God today? Maybe, maybe our recovery, our journey back to Him. Maybe our families, our plans for the future. What will being still mean in your life today? Stop trying to do God's work for him and listen to those that God puts in your path to walk this journey with you. Learn to trust that God is in control and not you and not anybody else. As we close our time in prayer today, I'd like to invite you to seek to connect yourself fully to the everlasting source of love, of mercy, and of grace that is our Father in heaven. Let us trust the source of all power, which is God. And let us ask him today to allow us to reconnect with him in a new and revitalizing way. Amen. Would you pray with me? Help us indeed, Father, this day to fully surrender to your will and purpose. To get connected to the perpetual source of mercy and of peace of truly amazing grace. Grant us a closer and more meaningful relationship with you that we may be transformed from the inside out, leaving our past behind, setting our behaviors, our bad connections aside, and truly come to trust the only King of glory, the King above all kings, you who called us your children, your friends, you who has a perfect plan for us, a plan to bring us a future full of hope. As we go through whatever it is that you have ordained in our lives, Father, may we consider it all joy. For we know that you are with us, building our character, developing our Christian-like attitudes, and you will not disappoint us. So may it be so, Father, in each of our lives. Strengthen our faith in the middle of fears. Guide us in all of our decisions. Bring peace into our hearts like only you can do. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus, through the eternal power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As always, we are so grateful to have had you join us in our service, and we pray that you will be motivated to put your faith in God into action. Would you please visit our website at 217faith.church, go over to our Facebook page, go over to our YouTube page, and help us to spread the word by liking and sharing and clicking on those notifications below. We are truly humbled by God's calling in our lives to preach His message of hope, of love, 
and of invitation. Would you join us? And together we can reach more who surely need a welcoming word of grace from God today. And so until we meet again, may the Lord bless you. May he protect you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his face to you and grant you peace. And so until the next time, go in the full assurance that God is with you, that he is in control, and that all he asks is that we trust in him and that we stay connected to him. May God bless you.